Welcome to Pushing Limits, KPFA's program by and about people with disabilities. I'm Mark Ramoser, and I'll be your host today. For the next half hour, we are talking about names, the labels people give people with disabilities and the labels we choose for ourselves. Sometimes labels are a result of able-bodied discomfort in talking to someone who looks or acts differently from them. The reason I'm here and want to hear this is because how do I start a conversation with someone? What's the appropriate way to, to do that? There's a simple answer to this question. To start a conversation with me, it's, it's preferred that you know my name, but if you've never met me, you don't know my name. Start with the person's name. You say, I'm Andrew. It's okay to ask about the disability if you want. It's all part of what you see. But historically and individually, the issue with names and labels is quite complex. To dive into it, we're going to take you to one of the weekly chat space sessions that happen every Friday at the Tri-County Independent Living Resource Center in the Santa Barbara area, just north of LA. This particular discussion happened on February 25th on the topic, how do we refer to people with disabilities? From handicap to crip, whatever we call ourselves and what others call us has repercussions for our self-worth our position in society, and our future on the planet. The discussion was led by Bonnie Elliott, and you'll hear from Andrew Oman, Rosa Lopez, Ella Moore, Vanessa Akane, Sandy Kreitzberg, Emily Bridges, Judith Lesner, Chelsea Craybill, and the Pushing Limits Collected was represented by Jacob Lesner Buxton, who hosts this regular event, and by Adrian Lobby. Here's Bonnie. Okay, well, my question is, what do some of the new terms mean in regards to, well, some people don't, don't like the word disabled, or I don't like the word handicapped, things like that. So there's just, I just wanted to start a discussion on that. We could open it up and say what names do folks like, what names give them pause. I don't like differently abled. I think I it. It's somebody that can have sex with four people at one time is someone who's differently abled. I find it really annoying. I don't like handicapped. I don't either. I don't like crippled. Mm -mm. Yep. The word, the word crip. Crip? Yeah. Crip, yeah. It's like people reclaim the word crippled by saying crip. Yeah, I'm not sure. There was a woman's comedy group of women who with disabilities who were called the Rye Crisps, W R Y Crips. Rye Crips, yeah, I was in it at one time. And it was funny. I mean, it, we had fun. I think the word Crip, it depends upon your, the tone of voice or whatever. But it also, to me, there's the Crips that's a gang and down in LA. I don't like that. We're talking about different terms for, for people with disabilities, the terminology that's changing over time. I wanted to talk about it because I'm getting older and I'm using terms that are some people find offensive. Sorry for not keeping up, but I need to you know, know what's going on. One word that bothered me, and I, I worked in special ed, both as a teacher and then as a district administrator, was <laughs> retarded. That word yeah. just makes me cringe. It's complicated. It depends mm -hmm. kind of on the context. Yep. When I came into the disability movement, Dis disabled was sort of okay, but people with disabilities was the words to use yeah. the phrase. The, the phrase yeah. And then it was like the cool and groovy people who'd been in Berkeley for a long time used the word Crips, like reclaiming it. It was like you could use that among ourselves, but not to the outside world. Mm. And most recently, someone came on our radio program and said, we're having trouble getting power in the election and we really need it because the right wing is going to just smash us. But most people who are disabled won't identify with the term. Mm -hmm. You know, we are a majority actually, or you know what you say, I think four out of 10, something humongous statistic. Wow. You know, those people, they don't identify. And so they're not a voting block. Mm -hmm. huh. And that was kind of an argument to me to think of a different way to talk about it. 
And I agree definitely with what Adrian just said that it does depend on context. In most cases, for example, I identify as either an autistic person or a person with autism, depending on the audiences or people who I speak to. I also, if it's like a group of people that are understanding or in close friends of mine that understand that I'm honestly joking about this. First of all, I would never use the R word. I feel like that is a legit curse word or it should be. But there have been some times where I said, my brain is just so spazzy today that I am not retaining any information or I'm having an OCD or ADHD moment. And I am trying to only limit those to people that are in certain social groups, like close friends and whatnot, and remaining cognizant of people who might take offense to that. So if I offended you and triggered you in any way, I apologize. I'm enjoying this conversation and hope it continues further. Thanks. Another phrase that bothers me is deaf and dumb. I'm spiritual. Those who know me recently, like this last week, I had a totally different perspective on things to say I am the D word or I have the D word means that I am owning it, that I'm claiming it, that I'm identifying with it. And it's also spiritually very limiting to say that. So I'm no longer claiming that. I don't know how that sits with this community, but it's a spiritual approach. I have some challenges or there are conditions that are challenging my body and my mind is an alternative. Okay. Well, let me give my opinion. I'll say what I need to say on that. Um, if I use the word challenge, everything's a challenge. They'll say, oh, okay, okay, you go challenge yourself then. They won't accept me as I am. And they won't try to make things more accessible. I can see for advocacy purposes mm -hmm. that maybe identifying as such is mm -hmm. important or, you know, needed for that credibility. Something that I observed in my learning and being involved in like disability communities. When I was in college, I was a deaf studies major. And in like the deaf community, the word disability is a no-no. You never say that. And then when I came here to ILRC, it was very like embraced and very different perspectives on the word disability is just really interesting. When I worked with the deaf community in my job, that was so true. The whole thing with cochlear implants and, you know, there's nothing wrong with us. We don't need fixing because we can't hear. It's a whole different culture, I think. I wonder how you feel about using the word limitations, particularly for individual illnesses or chronic diseases or whatever, where like you might say, Adrian is an asthmatic and that's true. Or you might say Adrian has breathing limitations. And do any of you prefer one thing over the other? I'd say she has asthma or has, has an asthmatic condition because it could be more serious than, than oh, she can't breathe sometimes. Do you need oxygen or you just need to have the door open for you to get fresh air? <laughs> to me, that's the difference right there. Yeah. Kayla had mentioned if anybody had any thoughts on saying challenges or difficulties when referring to individuals in the disability community. I just don't like the word challenges because it dismisses the seriousness of it. I agree with you, Bonnie. I, I think it takes away from the daily struggles that people with disabilities face. I would like to be a devil's advocate to you, Kelly. I appreciate your insight, but I also think that like Vanessa said, maybe asking how they identify like what their identities are, what terminology that they use, because yes, I do respect more often than not person-centered um, and being putting somebody in the driver's seat of like whatever sorts of route they want to take with their life. But that also includes what they want to identify as like, I'm autistic, I'm deaf, I'm blind, I'm whatever it is right here versus I have autism, I have deafness, I don't think anybody says that, or I have low vision issues. I think it honestly all depends on the choice of said person. I want to find out how an individual wants to be identified if I'm having the opportunity to interact directly with that individual. Everything is usually couched in terms of the norm. Everything is like a, a reaction to 
what's considered normal. Like oftentimes we deal with whiteness is normal and then everything <laughs> else has to be compared to whiteness. <laughs> male is normal yeah. and everything has to be compared to male. Yeah. And so I hear this term sometimes neurotypical and mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. And I'm really kind of less interested in what I think about it and more interested in what you think about it. I'm in a power wheelchair. So my disabilities, I don't walk. A lot of people in our community have been wounded by the things they've been called. And so if you say challenged, they felt like their disability was completely ignored because some school administrators said, oh, you just have challenges. Uh, They're going to react to that and think, oh, you're just not cool. And I don't want to talk to you. And you're maybe the enemy. So we're all sensitive about something. We all have stuff happen to us, whatever. Everybody has. I moved to an apartment a, a year ago and everybody here has had crap happen to them in their lives. And we get along pretty well. And it's just how it is. I think the thing about challenges is it puts the onus on the person with the disability yeah. to conquer the yeah. challenges yeah. rather yeah. than to have society at large accommodate to what the person needs. And so I really don't like challenges because yeah. I think it, it says if you were if you were better, you would be able to meet this challenge in a more yeah. regular way, not asking what it is that would make things easier for you. This is KPFA's disability program, Pushing Limits. Today, we're listening to an open discussion sponsored by the Tri-County Independent Living Resource Area about labels and names for people with disabilities. In the midst of the conversation, Jacob Lester Buxton said that the name of this radio program Pushing Limits always seemed like inspiration porn to him. He asked for the history of the name. Here's Adrian's response. A bunch of us were sitting in a room. There was about 15 people, and we had been fighting to get this show on the air on our lefty radio station. We were frantically learning all the skills, and somebody came up with this name, Pushing Limits, and everybody went, great, that works. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, we have this Curtis Mayfield song, which goes, uh, keep on pushing. And we use that as a theme song. And so that was kind of a great combination because he was also disabled. Keep on pushing. Keep on pushing. I've got to keep on pushing. Keep on pushing. I can't stop now. It has this, again, like what people were saying with challenges. If you just push through your limits, you can, you can make it. Yeah. But I'm actually glad you brought it up, except now, oh my God, Jacob, we might have to change the name after like 18 years. (laughs) I don't know. Um, How about pushing the envelope? I think pushing the limits is really quite good myself. But pushing, pushing is, is good. I think the limits is the problem, right? If it were pushing yeah. society, yeah. that's yeah. really what the show yeah. is about. It's not really about pushing your own personal limits. It's about pushing social limits. I mean, to me, it is. I like that interpretation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> when I hear it, it sounds like the limit are the limiters, the people who mm-hmm. place the limit. Yes. So that's what's being pushed on. So I don't, I don't see it necessarily <laughs> as a reflection of people who are different than others. It's like the limit of the people who can't accept difference. Yeah, pushing your limits, not our limits. Maybe we need to say that as our motto. (laughs) There were some words because we all have different perspectives about this conversation thus far. If everyone's feeling like ambivalent about or uncertain about using. I know differently abled is a word. (laughs) No, I don't like that one. Uh, What's that Nazi term? Parasites or... uh, Mm -hmm. Useless mouths, useless mouths, useless mouths. Yeah, handicapped is very old-fashioned. I don't like it, and I like even less handicapables. Yeah, I hate that one. And identifying as a person with a disability, so the person first. Currently, I think is for me the best way to identify. No, mm-hmm. it's not perfect, and and yes, there are very di- many different disabilities. So what I always like is if people ask me, well, what's your disability, or Oftentimes they'll start, you have arthritis, and I explain, 
Well, similar, but not the same. I can educate people mm-hmm. what my specific disability is. And usually, uh, if they don't know scleroderma, it's an education for them, and I think it helps them. I don't like exceptional. Yeah, neither. It's a fake kind of a term. And there used to be a magazine, I don't know if it still exists, called Exceptional Parent, which was even more offensive. Since as a parent, we do the best we can. We all do the best we can. And the idea that there's some people who did it better than others made them exceptional. So I don't like exceptional at all. <laughs> I don't like exceptional. Yeah, neither. I think it's it's a fake kind of a term. And so I don't like exceptional at all. <laughs> I think yeah. that the disabled community, and, and I like disability as a word, has to deal with the fact that being disabled is considered to be less than being able-bodied. And therefore, when they don't want to use the word, accepting the able-bodied definition that disability is not a good thing to have. I think in the way that Black people have claimed language, that the disabled community needs to claim language and say that disability is fine, we are disabled, and it's okay. And I think we have to stop accepting the definition that other people put on us. So years ago, there was a disabled magazine called Mouth, and they talked about people who are not disabled as TABs, temporarily able-bodied. And I really liked, I really liked that. (laughs) (laughs) It, It was I, I think if I had to choose, I would say it's people with disabilities and people who are tabs. I don't particularly like when people <clears throat> say this person with a disability is an inspiration. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, may, yeah I mean, they may open people's eyes, but then uh, it just has such a weird connotation to it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, uh, and, and unfortunately, I don't have a better term for it because. Uh, I think <clears throat> what a lot of people with disabilities achieve is amazing. The, the fact that someone learns how to live with a disability that has no cure and live their life to the best of their ability, but like I said, to be, to be called an inspiration feels a little bit strange. Well, the assumption is that looking disabled, whatever that is, is not okay. So the fact yeah. that you don't look disabled is a compliment to say that you could pass as one of us is what they're saying. Yeah, but, that's exactly right. You're I mean, right. I get their intention behind things, but at the same time, it's kind of like how the, I feel like I get their intention, but maybe I'm misreading things. It's like inherent racism. And this is inherent ableism, which says being able-bodied is better. So therefore not looking disabled, if you can't, if you, if you have to be disabled, you might as well not look disabled, and that's better. Right. Well, that was one of the words. Thank you, thank you, Judith. One of the words to me was ableism. You know, what is it? Is it a bad word, or is it? I mean, tell me what that what that, that really means. It's like racism. It's the assumption that able-bodied people and not having a disability is better than the alternative, and it comes out in the same way that racism does in these very subtle kind yep. of things that we've all been conditioned to and don't yeah. even realize anymore. You know, I would <laughs> say it's both subtle and blatant. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because you get it all on all levels. Yep. Thank you. I was also curious about, I guess, more so for people who might not identify as having a disability, like when approaching a conversation, um, when they first hear the word disability, it sometimes I think that deters people at first. So I'm curious, like, what other ways can I kind of ask about things that they might experience, but also being mindful of not using the wrong word that has like a negative connotation? I think one tool that that I've learned about more since working at ILRC is just making sure that you're using person-centered language. So because each person is different and because each situation is different, some people might be offended by a certain term or phrase Um, But if you really just kind of try to meet the person where they're at and just know that you're putting the individual before whatever term you're using, I think that's, that can be really helpful. 
on one hand, we want to be validated for being a human being and not special because we managed to put on our clothes in the morning. Yeah. But for some people, putting on your clothes in the morning, it takes courage <laughs> and physical uh, strength. If people say you're inspiring because you do something specific, then I feel okay about it. I see you're feeling really exhausted today, but you managed to make it to this meeting and you didn't go to sleep in the middle. That seems inspiring to me because it was hard. It's a good analogy. Thank you. Good, good explanation. Inspiration assumes that you're inspiring someone to do something or to be something or to somehow be better. And so what is it you're inspiring them to? Well, okay. So let me take you up on that, Judith. Okay. Jacob inspired me to make time to come to here. <laughs> because I've seen him doing these meetings and he always writes up a great thing about it, what it is. And I've wanted to come, but I love Jacob because he's very funny and he's very smart and being inspired. Like, well, if Jacob could do this, can't I just show up? I think that's legitimate inspiration. I was working very close with a therapist on diversity training and she would always ask my permission before she paid me a couple of weeks. Judith, can you say the last part? Part of it was working with this therapist who was asking permission to compliment him before, yeah. he, before she said it. Yeah, I think it goes along the line of the you're an inspiration and you're exceptional um, yeah. thing when having an invisible disability is if I mention that I get like really anxious or have depression, people are often like, wow, you're so brave for like doing anything. And it's such a backhanded compliment. And I don't see it as something that is great. I've been told that too. Oh, you're so brave. Mm -hmm. Me too. How would you rather be complimented? If someone no. feels sincere, compliment them. If I get something specific, compliment me on that. Compliment me on what I'm wearing. I can't think of an example right now, but um, if I did something that you liked, compliment me on that, but don't say I'm brave because of it. That means I did I'm less than. I, th I think it's different if I bake a great cake, if someone compliments me on the cake or they're complimenting me on the fact that despite my disabilities, I bake mm -hmm. the cake. Yeah, there you go. I think the idea is that the cake mm -hmm. is the accomplishment not mm -hmm. the fact that a person with disabilities made the cake. There you go. Thank you. I think it's, it's okay if people ask me what am I proud of. And for example, I'm proud of the fact that I, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I have survived scleroderma for 46, almost 47 years, which I know is exceptional. I am proud of that. And mm -hmm. my goal is to live long enough to where they'll find a cure. You can ask the other person other things you're proud of that tells you about them, their relationship with their disability. You get to know them better. That might be a good approach. I work in education and there's so much definition. You lay definitions and diagnoses on people. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, you're telling people what you think is important mm -hmm. because anybody is so much more than any kind of one particular Thing you yeah. could measure for mental disabilities like going back to depression something that i've struggled with before it's hard because people will use terms like i'm depressed for when they're sad mm -hmm. after not being able to get into a taco shop or something so <laughs> silly so if you were to tell people that you're struggling or you're depressed people don't often know on the scale of severe to insignificant really of where you're at with that something like you're unable to get your favorite food or if it, you can't get out of bed if we only had more words to describe mental illnesses i think that could possibly help allowing people to understand where we're coming from mm -hmm. there's a, a whole hierarchy in the disability community that's yeah. ignored and not ameliorated in any way and i think it's accepting the able-bodied view of disability creates the hierarchy i'm probably going to misquote this i think it was margaret mead 
who was asked about the origins of civilization. What's the first thing that happened that we look at the anthropological record and, mm-hmm. and people suggested different things. And the thing she said was, no, it was the first time they discovered someone who had a bone that had mended and that they had lived for years after a bone being mended would, would have been like one of the first indicators of civilization because what that meant mm-hmm is that there are other people who saw value in them and cared for them and treated them as something other than as an animal. And I think that's the challenge of the uh, disability community, to show the rest that we are worth saving and and that we have worth. And it'll improve all of humanity. If we embrace everybody, regardless of their capabilities, that is a good challenge. It's a good challenge worth repeating to show the world that people with disabilities are worth saving, that we have worth, that it will improve all of humanity if we raise everyone, regardless of their capabilities. Thanks to everyone who took part in the discussion, Bonnie Elliott, Andrew Roman, Rosa Lopez, Ella Moore, Vanessa Akain, Sandy Kreitzberg, Emily Bridges, Judith Lesner, Chelsea Craybell, Jacob Lesner Buxton, and Adrian Lobby. Thanks also to the Tri-County Independent Living Resource Center, who sponsors discussions like this every Friday afternoon. You can find them at ilrc-trico.org. We'll have a link to their website on our own website, pushinglimitsradio.org. Thanks to Jacob Lesnar Buxton, Sheila Gunn-Cushman, and Adrian Lobby for production work on this program. Get your pen and paper ready. This Sunday, August 28th, there will be a celebration of the life of disability activist and poet Neil Marcus. This live streamed event will happen from 2 to 3.30 p.m. The organizers have asked for memories or video clips under two minutes. Subtitles will be provided for the entire event and the celebration will be recorded for those who cannot attend. The link to, to register is, here's the pen and paper part, https colon slash slash bit.ly forward slash 3WWI1V capital S. The other letters are lowercase. That's HTTPS colon slash slash bit.ly slash 3WWI1V capital S. Or go to our website at pushinglimitsradio.org for the link. We'll also link to our June 3rd program about Neil's life, the New York Times obituary, and other tributes. We've been talking about naming and labels today, and I'd like to give Neil Marcus the last word. Neil often said, disability is not a brave struggle or courage in the face of adversity. Disability is an art. It's an ingenious way to live. This is Mark Ramoser. Thanks again to all our guests, our engineer, EA, Josh Elwood, and the entire Pushing Limits gang. And thank you for listening. Pushing Limits is produced by a collective of people with disabilities. Contact us by email at pushinglimits, all one word, at kpfa.org. Next week at this time, tune in for Education Today with Kitty Kelly Epstein. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Hi, I'm Kevin H., KPFA's new development director. I've been a longtime fan of the station's programming and mission that speaks truth to power and protects the health, wealth, and welfare of our listeners. I'm here to help all donors, especially our monthly sustainers. Also, to streamline the donation process for legacy gifts, stock donations, and employer matching. Please help us stay as vigilant as always and become a member today at kpfa.org. Thank you. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 
89.3 KPFB in Berkeley. KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno. 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz. And online worldwide. Worldwide. Worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.